Well, today we've had quite an exciting amount of conversation about quantum, quantum technologies, um, adjacent quantum technologies, and so now we're going to answer some of those key questions that have been kind of plaguing us throughout the course of the day. Um, and before we start, I'd like to have our panelists introduce themselves so that we kind of get a refresh of, of who we are hearing from today. So, Diego? Okay, Diego, Diego Lopez from Telefonica, working basically on quantum networking. Pranam Mundada from Q Control um, in quantum computing as well uh, on the software side. Christian Basila from Anion Systems, a superconducting quantum computing company. Bob Sutor from Inflection, formerly known as Cole Quanta. So let's start with kind of, we've got a, had a lot of information thrown at us. So just real quick, can we just kind of summarize what the status of quantum development is? I, I think we all have a, a basic understanding, but just real quick, just for our new audience members. Go ahead, go ahead, Kristen. Well, I, I, I think I, I've talked about it a little bit in my presentation, but I'll, I'll give, um, I guess, our view from the superconducting uh, architecture point of view. Um, if, if you go back five years, probably nobody could build a quantum computer, roughly speaking. Uh, last few years, they became available on the cloud. Where we are now is we're seeing quantum computers being deployed. Um, so we think that's going to keep on moving forward from a, so the devices are built, they're functional, but they're not to scale. So the, the real question, and I think I presented the optimist and pessimist perspective, um, our best guess, or if you listen to what people are saying, when a useful machine will be ready. Some people are saying end of this decade, others are saying it might take another decade or two. Uh, there are uh, many different what we call modalities, ways of, of making quantum devices, specifically computers. Uh, superconducting is one, and, and there are probably four or five, six different flavors of superconducting qubits as well. Uh, we do what are called neutral atoms, cold atoms. Uh, we cool them down with lasers. Ion traps are, are very popular and, in fact, are doing very well in terms of uh, coherence times and, and uh, uh, low error rates and, and things like that. There are a few uh, that are coming up that are very interesting, so-called quantum dots. Uh, the recent Nobel Prize in physics, in fact, was given for quantum dots, though not for quantum computing per se. And even very weird things like uh, vacancies in grown diamonds, nitrogen vacancies. Uh, if I had to guess uh, in 50 years what was going to be the dominant quantum technology, I'd have to leave a certain open probability saying we may not have even heard of it yet. Um, but uh, quantum does go beyond computing. Uh, it is being used for sensors, for clocks. Um, one area we haven't spoken about, for example, is medical, uh, biomedical devices, quantum sensors for that. Maybe a quick addition to that. Um, we are also seeing a lot of quantum devices being available to more uh, users. So I think our previous speaker today mentioned about open uh, quantum uh, test beds. Uh, I think these are very important as we uh, get more users involved so that we have new applications that we have not thought about uh, coming up in this area. And when it comes to quantum communication, so there are two, two um, fields in which we are already there. There are devices, and there are even commercial devices available. In, in the case of, well, the basic one that is a quantum number, uh, random number generators, the, 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 they are available and they have been already reported to be deployed inside mobile phones, etc. So it's something that is, is there to be used. And second is on quantum key distribution is still need some additional work for making it uh, mainstream and, and well integrated with normal communications. But right now there are, I would say, more than promising uh, field tests demonstrating the, the, uh, their, the, uh, its applicability. So one of the goals of OCP is to develop standards around, especially around emerging technologies. and. Um, Bob, in your presentation, you talked about benchmarks and the standardization of benchmarks. And going in a little bit deeper, um, we have several different types of benchmarks for quantum, but yet we are still concerned about developing more benchmarks. So maybe we can dive a little bit more into that conversation about the, the current benchmarks that we have, why it's important to develop a standardized benchmark. Uh, 20 to 25 years ago, I, I actually was involved in standards communities, things like the W3C, um, 
MathML, Italy, um, but also some international standards. And um, I think sometimes if you're on the science or the engineering, you want standards because it's a good idea. You want to connect things. As you said in your talk, you know, it's about communication. You have to, the plugs have to all fit together and things like this. Um, but at least on the software side, what we discovered was that there were people who just wanted to standardize. That's what they did all day long. They didn't care what it was, but they wanted to standardize. They were professional standardization people. That's what they got paid. But with the rise of open source about 20 years ago, things started to shift and say, well, why don't we see what works first? <laughs> and then when we get some practical experience and we see what tends to be popular, then we can standardize on those. I think we're in the same position with quantum right now. Um, there are not so many different modalities and submodalities and ways of doing this now. Um, there are some areas that it does make sense, like communications, to dovetail and to think very strongly about what quantum is. But in, in, let's say on the computing side, it's just much too early. <laughs> you know, it, it leans on standardization for the sake of standardization, not innovation, which is what we need during this next period, in my opinion. But I would say when, when you mentioned these uh, open source, at the end, mechanisms that are based on open source, making something that works, and having a pattern or, or, or a reference that you can compare to when you are developing something, is a good idea. This is another way, I mean, you can call it, I mean, is a way of making or building standards without making professional standards. And, and that probably would be a, a, a quite interesting approach. Having, having something that you can call, I don't know, a, a reference implementation that you can compare with and you can see how things uh, work. We used to get into these discussions of de facto versus de jure, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And de facto was like, yeah, well, everybody uses it. And de jure was, well, almost a, a jury has decided that this is the way to do it. Com com committee design. Right. <laughs> Designed by a committee who's never coded in their life, right? Uh, yeah. And so on the software side, um, <laughs> on the software side, do you see any areas that standardization for quantum could help with the advancement of the technologies, whether it be the computers or the sensors or what have you? Yeah, for sure. So uh, on the software side, uh, so maybe I would categorize standards in two different categories. One is uh, on the software side, let's say you have some uh, classical controller stack and you want to um, there are different uh, providers for that uh, classical controllers, um, and you want to use them interoperably. In that case, having some standards as to some standard language is very helpful. Um, maybe there, there are some things like Open Chasm 3, or there are this, uh, as you said, like openly uh, um, like accepted or like open sourced uh, standards that have come out. Um, but uh, the, on the other hand, there are standards for like benchmarking. That's completely, I think, premature, as uh, was mentioned, that uh, it's too early to say that, okay, let's have this particular metric and always benchmark that and always compare devices based on that. Kristen, do you have anything you want to well, add? Just to add on the benchmarking metric, um, I think there's been discussion on it. I, from where I stand, and I'll let the other panelists talk, I think everybody believes it's very important. It's just we haven't found the, the right answer yet. So, and, and I think that, that's going to take some technology evolution. So I, I haven't met someone yet that says, oh, no, we don't want to benchmark, or we don't think it's going to be relevant. It's more what's the right benchmark, and how can we get to it? Mm -hmm. It looks like we have. Um did you want to say one more thing, Bob? Bob? Oh, um, there are different types of benchmarks. I mean, I just might, uh, there are um, application benchmarks. So what are the high level things that people are trying to accomplish? So QAOA, right? I mean, you showed an example of that. Um, it, it's kind of middle level, but it's still a thing one wants to do versus T1s, T2s, and things like this, some of the very low level measurements. The problem, though, I must say, with quantum computing is that there is so, so much hype out there. Um, and uh, I've been responsible over the last few years of at least helping to publicize it, should we say. But there are some claims from some people that are just absolutely ridiculous. And that's why we do need test beds, such as in the last talk and, and things like this. And at some point, you just have to say, could a third party please test this and say, are the numbers as good as they say? <laughs> right? 
because people become very skeptical of, of you know, is it really as powerful? Um, I remember at one point, we suddenly had to realize that people, people were counting qubits that didn't actually work. <laughs> they were on the chips, but they didn't work. <laughs> well, I wouldn't count those, you know, and, and things like this, right? And, and so th this notion of somebody at least, <laughs> You know, giving a view of, of what the world is like and not just taking vendors or providers' words for it. So it looks like we have a question from the audience, so why don't we... You're all touching on some things that's very uh, dear to my heart. And uh, 25 years ago, I was the vice president for standards for the IEEE Computer Society. But my day job at Sun Microsystems was to do benchmarks, and I was in charge of the performance and the architecture group. So all of this stuff was like, how do we seek to create value as engineers and scientists and entrepreneurs in this world? And so I'm seeking that again now 25 years later and saying, what's the best way of doing this? And there seems to be like we're on the verge of a paradigm shift. And a lot of the things are focused on things that people think, you know, have a lot of glitz like quantum computing and like, you know, AI and so on and so forth. But you are the people who actually have the experience. I mean, you, some of you are working right in those companies that are doing the, the real hard hands-on work, making putting the bits on the wire or the, the qubits in the Josephson <laughs> kind of junction. Um, what would you advise people at the OCP here um, that you need the most um, in terms of the infrastructure and the, and the support to give you not just the credibility, but the collaboration you need. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the, well the, 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 there are, there are I, uh, and I was uh, during this afternoon, I was in the uh, downstairs in the, uh, I don't remember the name of the session, sorry, Cliff, but uh, the, in which people are talking about new initiatives, uh, etc. in which uh, I, I believe that, at least in my field, when it comes to, to issues regarding the interconnectivity, or the, the interconnection of quantum uh, uh, devices and how you can share quantum states across a network, etc., there are some proposals that are quite interesting that uh, can simplify something that uh, is something that uh, we can experiment a little bit ahead and that uh, we can rely on something that probably in the, the, uh, in the past days was not available. That is, in general, mechanisms for virtualization and, and mechanisms for, for emulating ahead of the, uh, of the availability of the real stuff. Uh, I believe this is this is very important, and from our from our point of view, the possibility of starting experimenting with how to connect two emulated quantum uh, quantum computers would allow us to play a little bit on how we can leverage uh, communication infrastructures to support that. So we don't have to to wait as happened in the old days to have full operational computers before you could uh, start thinking about how to connect them. I guess that in, in other cases, probably is the same. If you're talking about uh, software, for example, developing software with a, on top of an emulator should be cl very close to developing the software on, on, the, uh, on, the, on, on the real processor, etc. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up a little bit for those who aren't thinking about quantum and networking. Um, the information we're exchanging is not just bits, it's quantum states, as, as you just said, right? And in fact, when we talk about networking, it's much more general than traditional classical networking because it's even at the lowest level inside a device. So if you have multiple chips superconducting, at some point you've got to connect them somehow, some way to get bigger ones, right? Um, but the worst problem is if I take something of one modality, let's say neutral atoms, and then I want to connect it across the room even to something which is superconducting or ion trap or anything like this, I probably have to go through optical in the middle. I have to transduce while maintaining quantum states. And, um, and that's tricky and it's error prone and frankly nobody knows how to do it really well quite yet. But it's this heterogeneous problem which I think could be looked at sooner rather than the homogeneous problem. Because inside our own devices, thank you very much, we'll make them talk to each other. <laughs> right? We don't need somebody else to standardize that. But it's this you know, different to different 
that starts to get very interesting and also has other opportunities for, well, what does noise suppression look like when you're actually doing transduction, right, and things like this that would open up. Um, and individual vendors tend not to look at this because they worry about their own things, right? Yeah, absolutely. And also, to um, as you're talking about going in the fridge, uh, one thing that maybe uh, OCP community could help uh, with is like there's a lot of classical controllers also that we need um, to support this uh, system. So as like say qubit sizes, uh, I mean I'm talking on superconducting circuits, as you go beyond 1,000 qubits or a few 1,000 uh, qubits, you need some cryo CMOS technology down in the uh, Dell fridge because having all these cables go from room temperature is just not going to work. So I feel like there, I'm sure there's a lot of expertise around, like for example, the open source project uh, like Cubic or Kick, where you're using now Xilinx RFSOC chips, which are made for our tel uh, mobile phones. Now suddenly, the cost per channel uh, for controlling these qubits went down from $10,000 per channel to $1,000. And also the uh, form factor. So having these kind of things, um, where like other people who other parts of the community who are not quantum uh, can help is also something that OCP could help with. So we we've been talking about linking systems together in the in the quantum world in multiple quantum modalities, whether it be the same modality or different modalities. But Kristen, you mentioned. In, um, deploying on-premise quantum systems. And so at that, with that in the HPC data center, and with that, you're having to um, integrate quantum into classical, and that takes some, some networking, it takes some integration that we might not have thought of. Are there any challenges or, or anything that people might not have thinking about when they're thinking about the possibility of an on-prem system? So, so I'm sure there's a lot that we've thought about and a lot that we haven't. Uh, but the good thing is we will be deploying and we'll be working hand in hand with the customer. And it's part of our project to look at all of these challenges and see how we can optimize the communication. First, the usage of the quantum computer, the access of it to their existing 5,000 users. And then second, how they could divide a, a project or problem and connect it to their classical infrastructure. So. Uh, I think there, there are things in life that you can do on your own. There's other things where you just need to experiment on. Uh, this, this is probably one of those. I know in Europe, there's another vendor that's going through somewhat of a similar exercise. So I think these are the steps that can help accelerate the maturity of the, of the technology and that, that are going to be required. And so outside of just quantum networking, are other adjacent quantum technologies, will they be helpful? in this modular t architecture or being able to pass information from one quantum system to a next? Will, will quantum sensors be important in, in that development? And, and, and how? How can we expect that to develop? Uh, well, fundamental question is, where does the data come from? So one of the uh, misconceptions when people talk about quantum machine learning is they say, oh, this is so amazing. You have this powerful quantum computer. You're going to suck in petabytes worth of data, right, and things like this. That's not going to happen because with today's quantum computers, you are going to completely blow through what's called the coherence time. You're going to load a little bit of data, have no time left to do anything with it, and, and you're basically sunk. So the dream is to have this information that's already encoded in quantum states. Uh, well, when do you have that? Well, one time you have it is, in fact, in the middle of a computation. Right, so, so because everything's been encoded. Another time you may have it is with sensors. So if you have a quantum sensor and it's pulling in information, this information is somehow represented in quantum states. Fairly simple ones to begin with right now, but eventually they'll be fully entangled and, and so forth. Um, quantum memory, eventually our quantum storage um, is, is another place that eventually, once we figure out how to do that well, um, because you'd like to, on the side, load up information and then use it when you want to use it. Right now, um, quantum computers have no I.O. <laughs> you know, it's really back to the old days of flipping switches, zeros and ones, right? Yeah? That's, that's what it's like, and that's what it's like loading data right now. So we have to get, get past that somehow. So, so I, I think one of the things with the evolution of every single computer technology 
that comes along that we keep forgetting at the beginning. We get so excited about processors. And then we all decide it's the data stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why do we want processors? We want the data. We want to do interesting things with the data. So taking that data first approach, where is it coming from? What form is it in? Right? How do I store it? How do I get access to it? Is, is key to really advancing all of these. And that's why you can draw very nice diagrams connecting any of the quantum technologies we've talked about today. And many of the problems repeat themselves, such as your work, right? Again, um, noise suppression and things. That's everywhere, right? Software, it's everywhere. It's just different types. So let's talk about Q control for, for a moment. So I was talking to someone in the hallway a little bit earlier, and they were saying that they're really impressed with the results that you showed on the screen. But then the question came, if those are the types of results that you can get, why aren't we just using Q control software to, to run our models at this point in time and, and get perfect results? So perhaps is it possible to clarify that a little bit? Yeah. Um so maybe I'll clarify one thing that it's not 100% perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can think of it as, uh, let's say you create some um, quantum computers with um, some base errors. They come from your coherence times or whatever benchmarkings you do. Um, when you run applications, um, or algorithms that you care about, what you see is there's like orders of magnitude, and it's truly orders of magnitude difference between the performance that you would expect from the uh, like coherence times to what you actually get. What Q control does is through error suppression, pushes it all the way to the uh, actual hardware limit, um, where, I mean, at the end of the day, we can only compute as much coherence as there. So the, uh, to go further ahead, we need better quantum uh, hardware devices. Now, that's one part of the uh, question. The other part about whether, why are people not using it? Well, there are lots of people using it, and now, um, and we have been working on um, making it more user accessible. So, for example, uh, this year we released uh, our product Fire Opal, where, uh, as we went back to the point about reproducibility, which is so important, where, oh, I can say in my research paper that, oh, trust me, there's thousands of X improvement, but it's not meaningful if you cannot today go and check it on a quantum computer right now. And that's something that we have worked over years to ensure that. So today, you can check that. Uh, to take it further, in fact, um, um, in a month or two, we will be natively available on IBM devices, where you could just turn on a flag Q control equals true, and you will get that kind of performance. Um, so yeah, I, I'm actually uh, curious to hear more about what kind of applications people will try it out on. And I'm sure there's a lot of room there to grow further, because as we scale devices, uh, you go to different kind of devices, not just superconducting qubits. There are different kind of errors, as uh, Rob was mentioning, um, and different methods of uh, error suppression needed. But you still need error suppression. So there's a lot of uncertainty with quantum. And for an organization that might be thinking about it but on the fence because of some of these uncertainties and some of the um, issues that we've talked about with regards to development here, how would you advise someone to go back to their, their C-suite and, and discuss quantum computing? And, and even though it's not developed or as advanced as eventually it will be, the need to start becoming quantum ready and, and quantum aware. So um, I, would, I would say the answer is TRL, so technology readiness level. I think, I think people have to um, open, openly communicate to say it's a very interesting technology, but it's not at the commercialization stage, and it's not close to being there. But that being said, because of the value it can bring and because of the progress it has shown over the last few years, I think for most uh, corporation, for a lot of, of academic users, a lot of, of test beds, labs, there are a lot of people for whom it makes a lot of sense to invest in that technology today, to start to familiarize themselves with it, but the expectations have to, have to be right. Uh, and that's why we believe fundamentally that in the very, very near term, next few years, 
there should be probably more interest from government labs, government institutions, uh, yes, from industrial users, but probably in a lesser extent than over time that percentage should switch as the technology readiness level gets higher and higher. So, and, and as an example to the previous question, I remember one of your slides where you said if you run the test 32,000 times, you'll never get the right answer. So it's probably not ready to plan your next uh, you know, trip on Google Maps. <laughs> I think the answer varies by industry. So if you are a large financial services institution or a hedge fund, um, if you don't have a quantum research group, you probably don't want to tell the world that. But you should just make one <laughs> right away. Um, because it's a very competitive industry and you really have to have people who are absolutely up on the latest algorithm so that you know it becomes a time to market or a time to advantage situation. Um, what we are funding in general enterprises were because qu quantum is one of these, um, you know, people's eyes glaze over like, oh, I love quantum, you know. Uh, I mean, you've seen golden chandeliers in movies and things like this, right? And, and mm -hmm. quantum media, Ant-Man, <laughs> right? You know, all, the, all these things like this. And so a lot of times it was like, well, we're going to establish a quantum group. This is the most amazing thing. And then it's like three years go by, and what have you done for me? So we're seeing this migration of what were dedicated quantum research groups into just their advanced research areas, where they may also be working with AI and things like that. So you definitely have a core group of people who are up on the latest, who are smart, who know about the programming, who can give you an unbiased internal opinion um, about the state of the state for your business. Then, of course, Heather, I guess there are some third parties who can give you some, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, there are varieties, right? But, but you have to stay up on that. Um, and, you know, there are some industries that will, quantum will not affect them directly, you know, at all. They'll use some service, and yes, there's a quantum computer, but they themselves will not have to do that. <clears throat> but you need to get that grounding, and you need to know if you're one of the ones and what the timing is for you. <laughs> no, I, I, and about that one thing that uh, from time to time we tend to, to be a little bit too purist in the sense that I say, no, go quantum, and then you go totally quantum and you're not considering uh, situations in which you're, what is, in, what is uh, most important is precisely find a, a, a mix that satisfies the, the concrete use case. Uh, you were mentioning before this uh, when talking about the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, using the quantum computer as, a, as an accelerator for the HPC uh, uh, environment. In, in communications, and when we're talking about quantum safe communications, we have discovered that for sure quantum, quantum key distribution is equipment is delicate and expensive, and it's difficult to, 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 to make it work. But in certain circumstances, you can use it uh, for, for securing particular sensitive links, and then use other mechanisms for, for warranting the rest of the, uh, of, the, of the security. And this is perfectly fine, and it's, it's, uh, it's about identifying this environment in which a mixed approach would make sense, would save you time, would, would uh, provide an additional advantage that you wouldn't, wouldn't uh, achieve in other cases. Identify them, go for them, experiment with, with them, uh, and start learning about how to stand, uh, how, how this can be extended uh, to, to other cases. Thank you. So, so maybe I'll, I'll uh, add uh, another perspective on this, uh, which is completely non-technical, but uh, there's a very old saying that says, follow the money. So if you look at the field of quantum and you're trying to figure out how, how do you suppress the noise, right? What everybody is saying, this person is talking about this and that modality and this architecture and that, that algorithm, how do I try to make heads and tail of it? Well, if you read the headlines recently and you do a research of who has committed substantial amount of money to quantum, you're gonna, you're gonna hear things like, for example, the US Air Force Research Laboratory just announced a $25 million investment to do a initiative ABC with a certain vendor. Uh, there's a government institute or lab in Europe that invested tens of millions to do something else. So you, you look at where a lot of the people investing the substantial amounts, and, and a lot of it turns around government labs, government support, government intervention, and the flip side is you have some companies that announce that they have 100 users and you look at their, their revenues if they're public and then you see a million of revenues for the whole year. So 
you do the revenue per user, and I'm not using the exact amounts, but it tells you that the average user is not committing any substantial type of money to quantum at this stage for one supplier or one vendor, right? Whereas the government or government labs or government initiatives are in the tens of millions or more. I'm on a working group uh, that's uh, draft. It's for, for the World Economic Forum. Uh, and so um, I, I have arrived late to this group, but uh, to be published in January at Davos is what's called the Quantum Economic Blueprint. And so after a little bit of what is all this quantum stuff we're talking about, it does look at a worldwide view of, of the quantum story. And there are many aspects to it. I mean, supply chain is, is huge. Um, just where, you know, we learned during the pandemic, when you can't get chips, it kind of affects things a little bit, right? Um, well, it's very lumpy across the world, if you will, the, the, the quantum story. Um, there are some um, countries, I mean, Canada has an incredible program in terms of funding and great companies and things. France, <laughs> France, you know, Alice and Bob and all sorts of, you know, great venture funds and, and things like this. Um, but everybody's trying to figure out, you know, they want to be the best country, they want to have sovereign pride, and they want to say, but how do I get the people and the parts from you, right, and, and things like this. Um, so it's a fascinating world, and you know, there are a lot of these problems that do have to be resolved to actually get all the piece parts to make them work. And, and also, let me just say, <laughs> while parts are interesting, the goal is to have fully functional systems. So it's to have the integration with HPC, as you were saying. It's not just having a standalone little component, right? And I don't think there's enough investment in that. I think people are just spreading the money on lots of little parts. 270 different people get $10 each, <laughs> it seems, at times, right? And I think a lot of the, the government investing has to change in, in that same way to, to generate systems of record that really work. So we're coming up. We only have a few minutes left, so I'd like to see if there's anybody else who has any questions. Leave a little bit of time. And I, can. Uh, I have a question. So let me understand this right. Uh, we don't know how to retain data. We don't know how to transmit data in superposition state, but then we expect the quantum computers to be ready in a decade or so. Do I get it right? Partly. <laughs> At least when it comes to, 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 to uh, us changing data, they have been already demonstrated in a, in a, in a lab for short distances, but taking into account that the first uh, optical fiber transmission was like a couple of centimeters, and, uh, and it took five years, if I remember well, or so. So in that respect, I'm optimistic. You never know for sure, but I'm optimistic. Right now, we cannot, I mean, we cannot connect to quantum computers. No, and no, I'm, I'm, not talk, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not talking for disparaging uh, quantum right. computing, but just to try to understand where we are. For example, uh, in, in, in electrical signals, mm -hmm. uh, we can transmit data over thousands of uh, kilometers because we know we, we have those uh, ones and zeros. But I can't wrap, wrap my head around, for example, what is the, quantum, uh, the, the superposition state and how can I, I mean, it's not one, it's not zero. How can I transmit it, let's say, one meter? So, um, <laughs> okay. maybe let me answer. Uh, so, um, in terms of transmission, uh, there are, it depends on what uh, modality we are talking about. So, some modalities, actually, transmission is not so bad. Uh, some modalities, the uh, saving the data in some storage as a memory is not so bad either. So, for example, uh, the, uh, like maybe Diego will know best, but uh, and sending data, like uh, superposition states through satellite and uh, having it back, like having entangled uh, photons across the Earth has been done. Okay. Um, so uh, now the problem is that the, what is the yield rate? Like how often do you have to tra attempt it and it only success is like few percentage of the time. So it's now increasing the throughput that is important for that kind of thing. But now these are photons which are carrying quantum state uh, that is not used typically for uh, doing computation. I mean, there are new uh, companies coming up like Soi Quantum and Xanadu, which are trying to use that for computation, but that's not the 
standard way. On the other extreme, uh, superconducting circuits, um, there is way to store the data. Uh, like, I mean, in the sense that now there are self-correcting, uh, there's some recent uh, technical breakthroughs in the sense of um, if you have some data or like a qubit state, can you maintain it self-correctingly? And there are some promising things. We are not there yet, but there are uh, certainly things. And um, also in like uh, neutral atoms and uh, uh, like trapped ions, there are certain states where you can park your data uh, in quantum state no. and keep it. But uh, well, tip the, uh, now that, now we are going to start with the, with the interesting part. Oh, Cliff. There's, there's a general idea of a of a two state quantum system. All right. Last talk we heard of a three state, but generally a two state quantum system, and that's the qubit, the two. Yeah. There are lots of those that hang around. They're typically uh, shown in electrons and in photons. So electrons are the basis of most of the ones that we've talked about here, superconducting, ion trap, atoms, photons, of course, for, for <laughs> photons, um, and communication. So if you can get that quantum state into a photon in terms of its polarities, you can move that photon around and you can do interesting things. Now, one other point that you said at the very beginning and goes back to the first thing, I think your second slide, was that quantum computers are not replacements for classical computers. Yeah. They only do three categories of things well. And even the factoring problem, right? You know, should they ever be able to get big enough? All you gotta do is input that one number. You don't have to input a lot of data. Now, it may be a big number, right? But it's how the system works in the programming model, which is completely different from the classical model. No if then else's, no for loops and things like that. It's completely different. So think of it as a computational engine and don't think of it as a general purpose processor. Uh, and the important thing is that we're talking about how you represent the information. When you mentioned these ones and zeros, ones and zeros that, that don't matter as long as they, we, we don't have a clear way in which they represent information and allow, allow us to manipulate it. With a quantum state, you, you do the same. You, re, you have to represent the information on a quantum state and see how you can share that information and manipulate that information, manipulating or, or forwarding the quantum state. Is and anyway, what is a one or a zero? Exactly, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if I looked at an optical line, would I see little ones and zeros? Right? No. no, I wouldn't, right? Oh. So there is a physical manifestation. Okay, thank you. Well, good question, actually. Yes. Uh, that's, yeah. I want to thank the panel very much. It was actually, the discussion got pretty good as we got up to the end. And uh, thanks again for, uh, for being here today and all of the efforts. Thank you.